Well, good morning, everyone. And, good morning. and again, thank you uh, for having me. Thank you for uh, your hospitality. Thank you for having all of us. It's joyous uh, and, and, and glorious, wonderful to be on the Isle of Lewis and to be preaching um, in your church this morning. And also to those of you that are watching online, uh, another special welcome. And uh, I hope you really enjoy um, our service this morning. So, um, thank you. And uh, if we can start with the first hymn, Tell Out My Soul. <coughs> of life, let us this morning obtain nourishment for our souls. You are the light of the world, you are the good shepherd, you are the alpha and omega, you are the God who put the stars in its place. We desire you this morning, O oh God, to be with us and we hunger for more. And we pray, Lord, this morning that you would hear our prayers for increased presence and increased knowledge of who you are. And we come to you this morning, Lord, with thanksgiving in our hearts, and that you would hear our prayers. And we ask in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our next hymn uh, will be, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. <laughs>
reading this morning is taken from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, starting in verse 15. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel preached to you, that I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as first importance, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. That by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder, harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. Whether, then, it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this <coughs> is what you believed. This is the word of the Lord. If we have the next ten, Margaret. Thank you.
Well, it's a wonderful passage of scripture that I get to share with us all this morning and to, to preach from. It's an exciting part of scripture. It's uh, the wonderful truths laid out by Paul that we stand on. And the last hymn that we sang, you know, so many of the words are so theologically uh, brilliant, really. All other ground is sinking sand, isn't it? If we don't stand on the rock of Christ, what have we? At the end of the day, nothing. We, we stand on him. And uh, that is, of course, what Paul is saying uh, when we're, we're reading him here. I'm fortunate. I'm 57 years old and I've got a couple of older, I hope, wiser men than me that I talk to every month, one in Sweden, another in London. Both um, have been pastors all their life, both theologically educated, and we, we chat, talk, pray, and have discussions. And we've done that all during COVID, and it's been a real blessing to me, and they say to them. But uh, one of my friends, Rick, just a few weeks ago last year, his son is 32 years old. He's a preacher like me, like Duncan. Uh, two young children. Uh, one of them's two, the other is six months old. And uh, he was diagnosed with a tumour on the brain that was inoperable. And you can imagine mum and dad, can't you, receiving news like that. And within a few weeks, they had the best few weeks. They, he recovered um, incredibly for those few weeks. And then he died. And uh, what do you say? What do you say to someone facing something like that? Someone, though... Uh, his son, a Christian, his daughter-in-law, a Christian, and, and Rick, a preacher of the gospel all his life. And I think when we come to the difficulties, the impossibilities, the mysteries of life, I said to Rick, and thank God for Jesus Christ. We thank him for the little things. You know, while we've been on the Isle of Lewis, Rodney is the biologist, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's been a, a lecturer and, and he, he really wanted to see a humpback whale and his wife said no chance, you know, just, you know, she, she wasn't quite sure that an 84 year old man should be travelling up here, he's slightly unsteady on his feet but he, he came and we prayed and God is the, the you know, he, he answers our little prayers doesn't he? And there, out at sea, were two humpback whales that he could film and see for the first time in his life. And we know that's the grace and goodness of God saying yes. But of course, that's the least of it, isn't it? That is the least of what, why Christ came and what he's done. But of course, he, he is so interested in us. He so loves us. He so wants to answer our prayers and draw near to us. He's so kind, more than we'll ever know. And when the rubber hits the road with life, when things happen, have happened to my friend Rick, and he is feeling the pain. He's feeling that pain that, of course, is assuaged by a knowledge that his son is in a, <coughs> the best place possible. He's run the race, you know, he's running that race, he's turned a corner and there's the ticker tape, it's his own. He wasn't expecting it, he's expecting to raise children, he's expecting to even be a grandfather but his life is done and now he's with our Lord and in, in, the, in the best place that he could ever be that assuages some of the pain but of course in this life we grieve as Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus and I'm saying these stories because I want to begin with the ultimate enemy of all of us is death it's a hundred percent certainty you and I are going to die no one's escaped that. No one's walked away from that. We don't know when that will happen. We don't know if that's in a short time or whether that's in a long time. Last year I was having a, uh, a meal with a, a, our old next door neighbours. I didn't think that within 12 hours he would have a heart attack and die. He was 51. It was shocking to me. That's never happened to me. And that's when these words impact us. All of the ground is sinking. So it really is. And I'm here this morning to 
encourage us to hold fast to the faith and to believe. Because it's such a glorious hope that God will not let us go. It's a wonderful hope. Um, I, I have a battered old sort of car that uh, is, is, is a few years old, but it was given to me by a well-heeled couple, and, and 15 years ago, it was sort of top of the range, and it's been a marvellous uh, car. You know, if I rave for Skoda Octavia's, I don't know, but a brilliant car. And uh, this couple they, they, uh, that my aunt knew, they said, no, no, we'll, we'd rather give it away to someone who... So they gave it to me. And her husband, a very kind man, but very good man, but not really a Christian, which his wife knew. His wife, proper Christian. And she gave me her story of how she came to Christ, which was quite wonderful. I didn't think that she would be dead in two weeks. But two weeks after she died, and her son came to see her. She was an older lady. Her son came to see her. And he said, Mum, you know you're dying, don't you? And she smiled and she said, yes. It's very exciting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that is how I would like to go. It's very exciting. <laughs> Billy Graham was asked, are you, what do you think about dying? I mean, he's in his 80s and he's in his 90s. He, we probably thought he was going to live, live into his hundreds and... And he said, honestly, he said, I am looking forward to it. I am looking forward to it. The burden is laid down. We get to see Jesus face to face. We, we, we're impacted. We, we're going to live with a love that we can't hardly imagine his love for us. That's the truth of the gospel. That's the truth of Christianity. That's why we hold to it, why we share to it. And... Um, and really everything else. And so um, this, is, this is Paul uh, writing to the, this, the, these people who really grasp the gospel uh, amazingly. They're far from perfect, of course, the Corinthians. They're nowhere near perfect, but they've grasped the gospel. And, and Paul gives this caveat, as I would give it to all of us. You know, if you hold firmly to the word that I preach to you in verse 2, once you believe, that's the beginning. And in a way, life can be a test to hold, hold fast to it. My encouragement is hold fast to it. It's a glorious, glorious uh, gospel and, and what God has done. Hold fast to Jesus. As he will hold fast to you. The way Paul puts it, he says, not that I've already obtained it. And that, in other words, uh, salvation... Yes, he's saved, but he's also being saved. And he says, not that I've already obtained it, but I hold fast to that which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. Jesus Christ, for those of you that believe, he's taken hold of you. Hold fast and pursue and be relentless in that pursuit of going forward for Jesus. That's what I want to do with my life. My prayers are that God will far exceed what I can ask or imagine in this life. But God is the, the wise one. God knows what he's doing. Praying for another outpouring of the Spirit. Asking God what he did here, do in Brighton. But whether he does it, whether he doesn't do it. My salvation, my future, my hope is all in him. Everything else is sinking sand, isn't it? So that's, that's, the, that's the, the, the gospel, the, the good news, if you will, that... Paul is sharing to them, and that's what the gospel means. It's great news. When Paul's in the, the Greco-Roman world and all the gladiatorial games, all the slavery, all the oppression, all the superstition, he comes with good news. He doesn't oppose, actually, all these things that are going on. You know, there's the Greek goddess Diana or Artemis, there's the Roman gods. He, he doesn't oppose the culture. He just lifts it up and says, I've got great news for you. I've got some great news. God has done something that has changed the whole world. Let me tell you that who this God is and what he's done. It has changed world history. And it involves you because he wants you to hear it and because here I am. And so great was the gospel. So, so great was his preaching 
that in places like Ephesus, nobody was going to the temple anymore. No one was buying the trinkets anymore. No one was, was spending money buying these silver statues of Artemis because they'd heard the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul did. I mean, it, 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 was a, it wasn't easy for him, but he came into these places like Corinth and he preached the good news. <coughs> it's wonderful news to believe this gospel. And the, the benefits, if you will, of just believing this, this gospel to us, I think ultimately, when all is said and done, and there are other benefits in this life, our dependency on God and everything, but he's destroyed death. He's destroyed the ultimate enemy of you and me. And that if we'll hold fast to it, we'll live with him forever. It doesn't get any better than that. There's no greater gift that you and I can receive in this world from anyone. Remember the old proverb, what profits a man to gain the world but to lose his soul? There are many who profit in this world. There are many who profit enormously in this world. They have nothing. They, they, they have nothing. They will gain nothing um, whatsoever. My own father, and I come from a Catholic background, and it may seem strange, as, but, but occasionally I, the, the whispers of the Spirit would stir me as I grew up. I take First Communion, we're going to take Communion today, and, and I remember um, crying because the Lord said to me, I, it was very clear to me as I read an ancient uh, hymn. Someone gave me, my parents gave me a little sort of cardboard cutout um, w with some words from a 19th century hymn, as it turned out. Saviour, while my heart is tender, I would yield that heart to thee. All my life to thee surrender, thine and only thine to be. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Jesus spoke to me and said, I want your life. Seven. He said, I want your life. And I remember that as clearly as anything. Very, very clear. And I remember going downstairs, a little boy, I wasn't a, this big six foot chap, I was tiny little, I was seven years old, and I tugged on my mum and I said, I know what God wants. I know what he wants. He wants my life. And I thought about it. I was seven years old. And I thought about the visiting, you know, in, in those days, they, they sort of had visiting missionaries. These were the very holy men. You know, they, they'd come from somewhere in the middle of Africa or somewhere. And I, I thought, well, if I give you my life, you're going to ask me to do something. And so I dismissed it. I forgot about it. And God reminded me when I was 19. He asked me again. And this time I said yes. He reminded me of that moment. I said, this is what he wants. This is what God wants from all of us. He wants it yesterday. And he wants it this morning. He wants you to lay down your life to him again this morning. As he does every way, every day, take up your cross every day. <coughs> take up your cross for him every day. Well, I, I have a wonderful father, and uh, my father's 91, and he's, always, he, he's never been a man given to extremes. He's always been consistent. He's been a very godly man. Um, we learned to read, really, going to Catholic services, and, you know, being children, you go through the service, and Wait, waiting, waiting, you know, when you got nearer the end, it's like, good, the hour's nearly up, you know, you can, but I learned to read that way, and kneel down, and, and, and I learned some of the things about Jesus. This was my dad, all through life, he's been very for us, he was, uh, he was born an orphan. So, to see my dad who's been there all for you, all your life. On a, he's unable to move now. He's had a stroke. He's on a bed of sickness. And you see what it's life at the end. My wonderful, wonderful father. And I've sat with him. And for the last year, the last month or two, uh, my will for my dad, who's a good man, a moral man, a faithful man, but I want to be certain that he knows it's the grace and mercy of God, the blood of Jesus, that will enable him to enter eternal life. I want him to know that. More than anything. And I've had some of the best conversations with my dad that I've ever had. 
and I know he believes now. I know he trusts alone in Jesus Christ for his salvation. And I've seen it, and I believe it, and I know it. That's the gospel that Paul preached. Not works. Not being a good person. My dad is all of those things. And I wanted him to know that, and I have 100% certainty, as I look at my dad now, that very soon he will be in eternity with Jesus forever, and we will meet again. I thank God for the gospel. I thank God I understand it, and I thank God for what Paul is writing here um, for us today. So what else is Paul saying? Of course, he's, he's, he's giving us the epicenter that Christ died for our sins. I've heard that since I was a little boy. Christ died for our sins. Listen, when I'm looking at my dad facing eternity, as you and I will one day, maybe we'll have a, a, you know, a nice lead-in to, to facing <coughs> Jesus. Maybe not. We don't know. But he died for our sins. That gift of God that he has given you and me, if indeed you've received that gift from him, and it is a gift. It's a gift. Not by works. If we have received that gift from God, that is the greatest gift any human being can receive. There's no greater gift than that. And that's what Paul is saying here, that it's of first importance that Christ died for our sins. And I think sometimes in the church there's, a, there's an element, of course, we pray, Lord, we'd love to see a humpback whale. We do. Lord, we'd love to, you know, I, 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 want, I would love to see the Reverend William MacLeod. I was praying that, thinking it would be impossible. He's too old. I'm certainly not going to knock on his door, but I did. That's my answer to prayer. Um, and to be able to speak to a living, breathing witness who was saved in, the, in, in this amazing revival that you've seen. You see, no one can ever tell you that you don't know. It's within your history you do know. You do know the possibilities and what God can do. You do have an understanding of God that isn't given to everyone everywhere, but you have it. Glory to God. Be hungry for more of him, is my encouragement, as, as we are. The world can take it away. And I know the world is as invasive here as it is in my city of Brighton. My city has more bright lights and coffee shops than you have here. But you only need, you only need access to the World Wide Web. There's distraction from being alone and being desperate and being hungry for the living God. And God wants us to pray and to be hungry. And what I love when Paul is talking here, and this, this is for all of us, is, is that it's all rooted in history. Everything's rooted. Remember, when Paul's writing this letter, there are so many hostile witnesses to Christianity who would prefer it not to be true. Hundreds of people have seen the resurrected Jesus. And eyewitness accounts are very strong. Let me read to you from 1 John. The Apostle John. This is a monotheist. This is a person schooled in, in Judaism. This is a man who spent three years, night and day, with our Messiah and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And he has come to believe. Not only that he's resurrected, of course, but this man is God. Imagine to spend three years with a man and you see nothing in him. Not a trace of lust, not a trace of gossip, not a, a trace of anything. He is a perfect man. A man that he deems fit to worship and says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, we have looked at, our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. John's saying, John is an eyewitness. Eyewitness testimonies are very strong. He's touched Jesus. He's eaten and drank with him. He's talked with him. And as an eyewitness to the truth. And that really, again, is, is one of the things. So, of course, you know, Paul's, Paul is saying here, this is true. It's rooted in history. Our faith is rooted in fact and history and truth and eyewitnesses that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and that as a result, our sins are forgiven us. Isn't, isn't that glorious to know that? To know that as we step away from here today, 
That's the first and foremost epicenter of our faith. Oh, it's wonderful to, 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 you know, I love my wife. I've married a wonderful wife. She's very good for me. Siberian wives tend to be good for people. My children are fantastic. I love my kids, you know. I, 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 I love being a dad. I love where I live. I love our church fellowship and our family. But when all is said and done, my sins are forgiven me. That's the great gift. Oh, I'm surrounded by other gifts, as you will be. Surrounded by gifts from God. He's good to you. But the greatest gift, the greatest gift, is that your sins are forgiven you. Paid for in full by the God-man who died on the cross for our sins. And um, Paul then <coughs> kind of concludes, as I will uh, conclude from, the, from the, the, the importance of this gospel and the, the people that are there, to um, the describing himself. I am the least of the apostles, he says. He says another time to Timothy, he, something like um, uh, when, he's, when he's talking, he said, here's, here's a, a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ died on the cross for sinners, of whom I am the worst. I mean, imagine saying that about yourself. Paul really did feel that. Paul was chosen. Yes, he's intellectually brilliant. He's a, a schooled under Gamaliel, all of these things. But, but really, one of the things you'd look at Paul would be that you persecuted and killed Christians. You were an evil man. And now you're proclaiming love. This is the apostle that wrote 1 Corinthians 13, love. Now you're proclaiming this gospel. Now you're going out. You see, God uses the weak things to shame the wise. Paul is really saying, that's me. And, and when he's saying, I'm the least, he means it. God chooses the least. <coughs> now, when we look at ourselves so often, we think, well, we're not noble birth, as I said last night, or we're, we're not that important, fantastic, then you can be used by God. Because God chooses the least. So often, because then no one can boast, because then his glory is known. And I think in many ways, Paul exemplified that, and of course he worked harder than everyone else um, to be able to take the gospel and for people to um, see him and look at him as, as, as the kind of embodiment of Jesus Christ. So I'm saying that because, you know, on an island, the Outer Hebrides, this little island in the world, known all over the Christian world, God can do it again through you. Will he do it again? That's down to God. But he can, and you can ask, and you can pray, and you can be hungry. Because you know what God is capable of doing. You know the gospel is true. You know your sins are forgiven. And so the good news has to be shared. It has to be proclaimed. That's what it's called, really. It's, it's a, it has to be proclaimed to those around you. It has to be known to those around you. Because it's true. Because it is, it is the message of God. It is God's message to your community and to the wider world. And that's my encouragement to you today. Be encouraged with all that God is doing. All that he will do. And when you walk out of these doors today, you know, just have a little jump in your, my sins are forgiven me. My sins are forgiven me. And as we take communion in a moment, we're reminding ourselves, his broken body, we're reminding ourselves of the blood of Jesus. His blood, his body, not ours. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen? So we're going to take communion in a moment, and Margaret, if you'd like to sing the next thing. Thank you.
Father, as we come to you to take communion this morning, we ask, Lord, if there's anything in our hearts that is in any way offensive to you, anyone we need to make up with, anything at all that you would show us by the power of your Spirit, Lord, and convict us. Reveal to us again once more this morning that you are holy and that you're making us holy and that we are holy. In Jesus' name. So just have a think about that just for a moment or two and just talk to the Lord. Confess your sins to him. And God is faithful and he will forgive you all of your sins. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes in glory. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. And that is why many of you are sick, weak and ill and have fallen asleep. So the communion cup is, the bread is open to everyone who believes what I've been sharing about this morning. And you can take communion this morning with joy, with joy on your face, knowing that as you take this, you're remembering his body and his blood <coughs> has taken away all of your sins. So when you're ready. So let's take the bread together. together take the cup of his blood shed for our sins.
Father, may we leave today joyful and thank with thanksgiving in our hearts. And in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.